اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم Dear brothers, sisters, viewers around the world, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is indeed a pleasure to be spending uh, some time with you in this very blessed occasion as we embark on a journey of spirituality, a journey of purification, a journey of self discovery and a journey of repentance, devotion, supplication, and seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the holy month of Ramadan. My felicitations and congratulations upon you all on this blessed month, uh, the holiest of all months in the Muslim calendar, and a time where uh, we hope, inshallah, we can uh, seek uh, proximity and nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we uh, enter this holy month, uh, for most of you, the month of Ramadan begins tomorrow, so that makes tonight the eve of the first night of the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, as we enter in this month, it's important that we try and uh, prepare ourselves. When you go on a trip, a holiday, perhaps overseas, uh, oftentimes there is a long period of preparation. Uh, you ensure that you have um, your plans ready, you know where you're going, you know uh, which uh, are going to be the highlights of your trip, which are the hallmarks and uh, important tourist destinations that you wish to visit. All this preparation goes into making uh, not just a joyous and successful trip, but perhaps most importantly, the idea is to maximize the time and effort and money you're putting in in this one, two, three week holiday so that you can come back with uh, a, an uplifted spirit and uh, ready to take on uh, your job and whatever challenges you have in life, having cleansed yourself and having achieved uh, uh, even uh, just a, a degree of, of happiness and peace. So just as when you prepare before you go on a holiday, it's important that you and I also prepare before we set out on this journey in the holy month of Ramadan. Again, the idea is that we maximize our time. We maximize uh, the uh, rewards that we wish to reap from this holy month. The vast majority of people, let's say, uh, or there is a sizable number of people who enter the holy month of Ramadan and uh, don't really maximize the benefits of this holy month. And so what tends to happen is that most people associate the month of Ramadan with what? With fasting. Right? And of course, fasting is a big part of this holy month. However, we don't want to exit this holy month. We don't want to end the month of Ramadan having only achieved fasting. Of course, fasting is very beneficial. Fasting is very um, important for our, our spirits, our souls, of course, our bodies. It detoxifies you. It cleanses you. And it's an important part of the holy month. It goes without saying. However, uh, is that the only thing we can achieve in the holy month of Ramadan? Is fasting and the detoxification of our bodies the best thing we can do? The answer, of course, is a resounding no. There are many, many benefits we can reap from, the, from this holy month. I refer you to a beautiful narration from the holy prophet of Islam, the prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and everlasting blessings be upon him and upon his family who describes this beautiful scene on the Day of Judgment when this young, very beautiful looking man uh, comes to the scene of uh, the Day of Judgment where everybody's amassed, everyone's there waiting uh, for them to be told of their fate, waiting to receive their reckoning and their judgment. You have the regular folk, you have 
men and women, you have prophets, you have apostles, you have messengers. And then this young, fine-looking person comes into the scene. And the prophet then describes how uh, people say, well, who is this person? He is so appealing. He gives you peace just looking at him. And so he doesn't speak to anyone. He doesn't engage with anyone. He simply walks past everyone who has amassed on the plains of the Day of Judgment. He then proceeds and, and goes beyond the people and then goes beyond the prophets and goes beyond the apostles. And then he takes his position up on a hilltop and sits there for everyone to marvel at his beauty and at the peace that you get simply from looking at him. Then the Prophet will say, that is the holy month of Ramadan. You can go up to him and take whatever you wish from him. On that dreaded day, on that day when people will abandon their brothers and their sisters, when mothers will abandon their children, on the day when people will be begging and pleading for even a small amount of water and, and shelter and a shade and whatnot. When people are in such desperation, when they don't know whether they're going to end up in heaven or in hell, the Prophet says, you want peace, you can get him from that person. You want happiness, you can get it from that person. You want a garment with which you can cover yourself, your flaws, your mistakes, your sins, you can get it from that person. Who is that person, O Messenger of God? The Prophet shall say, that is the holy month of Ramadan. Brothers and sisters, whatever we do in this holy month, we can reap from it on the day of judgment in proportion to what we did in this world. So, let's maximize what we reap from it. Let's try and get as much from it as we possibly can, right? I mentioned the example of someone who's going on a holiday. It's important that we prepare before we go in. We have our own schedule for the month of Ramadan. We decide right from this, ten, from, from this night how we're going to maximize our time, how we're going to maximize our effort. The fact that you'll be fasting, of course, many of you will, except those who have a religiously sanctioned excuse not to. Well, you know that right before iftar time, right about this time, if you live in London or its surrounding areas, you know that you're going to be tired. And so, if you're going to recite the Qur'an, don't leave it at the last second, at the last minute. You know that you're going to be reciting the beautiful, uplifting, spiritually illuminating supplications of the holy month of Ramadan. Whether it be Dua Iftitah, whether it be Dua Abu Hamza, whether it be Dua al sahar or other supplications that have been prescribed specifically for the month of Ramadan. Well, don't leave them for a time when you're too exhausted, when you're too tired. Try and maximize by planning. That is my point. Make sure you do that tonight, inshallah, so that you could get the best and most from this holy month. That's point number one. Point number two, and of course, inshallah, later on in the program, um, in about uh, 45 minutes or so, we'll open up the hotlines. You can call in with your questions or comments, inshallah. So if you have any questions or comments, do take a note of them now, so that when we announce the, the phone numbers, you can then call and discuss. But for now, that's point number one. Point number two, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the holy month of Ramadan in the Qur'an. But look at the way he speaks about it. He says, Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. Then, immediately after that, he says, Alladhi unzila fihil Quran. Hudan linnas. The holy month of Ramadan is special. Why? Because this is the month when the holy Quran, the book of Allah, the last revelation was revealed. And so there is an inseparable bond between the next 30 days and nights and the 30 chapters, the 30 parts, if you like, of the Holy Qur'an. There is an inseparable bond. There is something that connects these two together that we can try and discover, we can try and explore for ourselves if we recognize this reality, right? So keep this in mind. 
The month of Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. It is the month of reciting the Qur'an. It is the month of exploring the Qur'an. It is the month of returning to the Qur'an. It is the month of contemplating on the Qur'an. Brothers and sisters, it is such a sad reality that for, for some of us at least, the Holy Qur'an is only a book that we open in the month of Ramadan. It's a book that we recite in this month only. But you know what? Let's maximize that again. Even if your attention on the Qur'an diminishes in the days and weeks and months after the holy month of Ramadan, at least let us maximize our benefit from the Qur'an in this holy month, right? And I want to talk a little bit about this inshallah in depth. In the next few um, nights, perhaps over the next week where I will be here inshallah on Ahlul Bayt TV, um, talking with you and uh, having discussions and trying to answer some of your questions inshallah I want to focus on the Holy Quran and my hope is that if Allah gives me life and uh, gives me the privilege of addressing his sacred book that I will take a chapter of the Holy Quran probably Surah Luqman and uh, try and explore the vastness of this incredible book, brothers and sisters. Amirul Mu'mineen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the commander of the faithful. For you and I who proclaim his love and who profess his fellowship, this matters, this is relevant. Amirul Mu'mineen says that the Quran is like an ocean whose depth can never be reached. It is like a sea that is so deep that no one can ever dive all the way down to the abyss. This is a book of Allah. This is a book that God sent as His final revelation, brothers and sisters. Just try and let that sink in for a moment. God has spoken to His creatures for millennia. God sent His first prophet Adam and he sent 124,000 other prophets between Adam and between our holy messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And so he has conversed and he has spoken to his creatures in different ways and in different books and in different revelations. He has done that for a very long time. Then God chooses to conclude his messages to humanity with the holy Quran. Imagine if someone was writing to you for a very long time, years and years of being pen pals, of sending you letter after letter, and then they send you another letter that says, this will be the last time I write to you. What that means is that this letter is going to contain the most important of his messages. This letter is going to contain really all that which the other person wishes to convey to you. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends His final revelation with the final prophet in the form of the Qur'an in the holy month of Ramadan. What does that mean? What does it mean? I'll leave it to you to think about that. It means let us take the Qur'an seriously. Brothers and sisters, unfortunately, uh, many people don't do that. I'll explain how. You'll see that the Qur'an is a, a book that they bring to a wedding to officiate the uh, new beginning or the new life of this couple. The Qur'an is always seen somewhere in that picture, right? You'll see people take the Qur'an as a, as a means of, of providing a, a positive good omen to someone who's about to travel somewhere. And so they'll have to walk underneath the Qur'an and kiss the Qur'an. You'll see the Qur'an being written or verses of the Qur'an being written in ornate, artistic, beautiful um, canvases. And we've seen this done by countless, uh, incredibly talented people uh, throughout the centuries, right? Now there are many people who do that as well. But that's about it, right? Verses of the Qur'an might be recited here and there. Ayatul Kursi might be recited when someone sets out to go to work in the morning. Or Surah Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad is recited before we go to bed because it's recommended to recite Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad or Surah Tawheed three times before you go to bed 
for which you will be rewarded as if as though you have read the entire Quran. All these things are done and they're great and they're beautiful and they should be encouraged and they should be um, done and practiced. But that's about it. Brothers and sisters, the Quran is more than just a book that ornates or beautifies our weddings. The Quran is more than just a collection of um, words that make the inside of our mosques beautiful and attractive. The Quran is much, much more than that. As I said in the tradition of Amir al-Mu'mineen, it's an ocean that you can never dive, dive all the way down to its bottom. The Quran is a book that we are required to contemplate on, right? Allah will never reprimand you for never praying Salatul Layl. He will never reprimand you for never doing extra pilgrimages to the house of, of, of Allah. God will never reprimand you for, for not doing things that are recommended, that are mustahab. But Allah will repr reprimand us. He will rebuke us. He will, uh, in fact, punish us if we do not contemplate and apply the contemplate on and apply the verses of the Quran on our lives. Why do I say that? It's in the Quran. Quran. Do they never contemplate on the verses of the Quran and apply those verses and the teachings they derive from those verses onto their lives? Tadabbur literally means when you uh, in Arabic, they say tadbir. Tadbir means to plan and to scheme and to, uh, uh, and to run something in a proper manner, right? So tadbir al-amr, tadbir al-hayat, to apply a set of teachings on your life so as to make your life subject and subservient to those teachings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ or are there locks and chains that are, that are keeping these hearts in, unable to engage with the Qur'an, unable to contemplate about the Qur'an, unable to think and make deductions from the verses of the Holy Qur'an. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us about this. Allah wants us to take this book and not just recite it in a beautiful manner, though that is beautiful and not just use it as a means of protection, though that is commendable. He wants us to contemplate. He wants us to recite. He wants us to do so as much as we can. Brothers and sisters, think about this for a moment. Traditionally, we are told that when you recite the Quran, try and uh, recite as much as possible, right? Don't overdo it. وَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, read as much as you can. Don't overdo it. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. But in the holy month of Ramadan, there is an exception to that rule. The exception is, Imam al says, read as much as you can. I know people who recite a third of the Qur'an every single day. In other words, every three days, they've recited the entire Qur'an. For most of us, we, are, we become proud of ourselves if we recite the Qur'an in its entirety during the holy month of Ramadan altogether, right? But the idea here is what I'm trying to convey is that we should try and maximize. Don't be content with just one juz, one part of the Qur'an every day. Don't be content with only a set number of pages, 21 pages, right? Do not be content with that, not in the month of Ramadan, right? Another point I want to mention is this, that the Qur'an, uh, as, I was been, as I was saying earlier, is more than just a means of protection or a means of blessing, right? It should be taken as a book of guidance, right? Let me share a couple of examples with you, which I think you'll find really interesting. For example, the Qur'an, unfortunately, you look at our lives, right? When it comes to getting married, we have created these, and I've talked about this before many times, we've created these false idols in our head. And um, the, the idols that they used to worship back in the pre-Islamic pagan era were idols that they would create with their hands. And Allah talks about this in numerous verses. He says, you created them with your own hands, with your bare hands, right? And now you sit there and cry 
because an animal came and urinated on this idol of yours. Well, you created it. And you turned it into, or you pretended like it was a god. And now you're upset that your god is being desecrated by an animal that was walking past it, right? We create idols in our heads. And then we get stuck in how we deal with these idols. Let me give you an example. When it comes to marriage, a lot of times you ask young people, why aren't you married? Well, married, well, the answer most of the time is because we have a long list of uh, boxes that need to be ticked, a long list of conditions, and the right person has, you know, we haven't right, found the right person. And by not having found the right person, what they really mean to say is that we've created this fantastical, imaginary, magical fairy tale world in our heads where our spouse is this, you know, um, knight in shining armor if you're a woman or if you're a man, this, this beautiful damsel from paradise. And the end result is obviously there is no such person. People are just as flawed, just as broken, just as uh, having just as many um, issues and problems as you do. Just because, just as you are not perfect, your potential spouse is also not perfect. The idea is that you find what the Quran and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt call kuf, kuf akifa wal mu'minun ba'dhum akifa u ba'dh. Kuf means they are your counterpart. They are your equal. And so we sit down and then we wonder, well, what does it mean if I'm going to find an equal? Because I have, say, a master's degree, then my equal, my counterpart, my potential spouse, also has to have a master's degree. That's not what a kifa means. That's not what equal means. The Prophet and the Imams have consistently told us, the Quran itself teaches us, that to be an equal with someone, you have to have equal faith. Meaning that believers are equals to one another. That's it. No other conditions, no other boxes to tick, nothing else. Just because you have a master's degree or a PhD doesn't mean that your spouse has to have the same. As long as they are believers, as long as they uphold the same values, as long as they share the same, if you like, beliefs in life, then they are your equals. Just because they don't earn as much as you do, doesn't matter. That's completely irrelevant. Brothers and sisters, let's go back to the values of the Qur'an. Let's read it, let's recite it, let's contemplate over it, but let's also go back to its values. Let me share another beautiful example from the Qur Holy Qur'an. You know, scholars have said that Surah um, Al-Kawthar, which is the shortest surah, the sh shortest chapter in the Holy Qur'an. Scholars have made 82 deductions from this short chapter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This short chapter, 82 different lessons can be derived from this short chapter and can be applied to our lives and your lives. Brothers and sisters, a little contemplation, a little effort, a little time put into the Holy Quran this month can truly reap incredible, mind-boggling results. Let me share another verse with you. This verse, let me give you some context, right? So essentially what happened was, Prophet Ibrahim is an old man. He's now at the age of around 80 years old. His wife, Sarah, who was also his cousin, she was always barren, right? So not only is she also probably around the same age as Ibrahim, let's say 10 years younger, plus or minus, doesn't matter. What's, what's pertinent to this story is that she was barren. She could not bear children. She was infertile. So you have an old man around the age of 80 with a barren wife, right? Now God wants to bestow the gift of a child upon this couple. What does he do? He sends a number of his most important prophets, right? This is a beautiful story. There's only one part that I want to draw your attention to, but I'll, I'm just trying to give you some context. God sends His top lieutenants, if you like, His most lofty angels, Jibra'il, Mikail, 
Israfil, Azrael, four of them. They go to pay Prophet Ibrahim a visit. But in order to do so, they wear the garb of men, meaning that they appear in the form of humans as opposed to angels. The Quran paints a story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they came to visit Ibrahim. Let me share this with you actually. I'll read the actual verses. It's beautiful. This is in Surah al dhariyat verses 24 to 30. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I quote, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هل أتاك حديث ضيف إبراهيم المكرمين Have you learnt of the story of the guests of Ibrahim who were honored? هل أتاك حديث ضيف إبراهيم المكرمين إذ دخلوا عليه فقالوا سلاما who entered upon him and began by greeting him. As-salam, salama, meaning peace be upon you. فَقَالُوا سَلَامًا قَالَ سَلَامٌ قَوْمٌ مُنْكَرُونَ He said, salam in response to them. Peace be upon you. قَوْمٌ مُنْكَرُونَ You are a group of people who I don't recognize. Who are you? I've never seen you. You're strangers to me. Listen. فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينٍ This is the verse I want you to focus on. فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينٍ رَاغَ means that he snuck out to his wife. His wife was in another room and Ibrahim didn't excuse himself. He didn't just get up and say, excuse me. I'll go and see if we have any food because that would be a little awkward, right? If you tell your guests, let me go see if I can find some food for you, the guest is going to say, you know what? That's okay, we're not going to eat. Instead, Ibrahim raga Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he snuck out secretly. Faragha ila ahlihi. He went to who? He went to his wife. A lot of women say, well, our job is not to cook in the house. Well, what's wrong with cooking? <laughs> Just like I say to the husbands, what's wrong with maybe cleaning every once in a while? What's wrong with washing the dishes? My father, who's a 72-year-old ayatollah and an author of over 500 books, still cleans the dishes, right? He actually goes and washes the dishes. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with cooking? Why is it that this, this modern notion of this, this career woman has made Traditional tasks look repulsive and disgusting. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing wrong in doing what we call menial tasks. These are not menial tasks. This is the husband and wife caring for one another. This is the wife cooking for her children. Would you want your children to eat fast food or food brought and prepared by other people, by strangers? You don't know what they've done. You don't know how they've prepared the food. Or do you want to be the one who prepares Food for your children, there's nothing wrong with it. فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ He went to his wife. فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينٍ Then Ibrahim came back. He went to his wife. He told her, do we have anything? She said, all we have is this um, calf. But the calf happened to be a fat one, right? A real good, juicy looking calf. And so Ibrahim said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to slaughter the calf. Give it to you. I'd like you to cook kebabs for us, right? Call it a barbecue, call it whatever you want. In other words, the Quran is specific on this. There's another verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes into more detail. And in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, it said, they say that he cooked and he made kebabs for them. Meaning, it's the best food you can offer someone, right? I mean, you could have made anything else. You could have made some dessert. You could have made, I don't know. But this was considered to be the top, you know, best, most delicious, most nutritious food you can offer to your guest. And so she did all of that. She prepared it. Which tells you so much about Sarah as well, right? I mean, 
for her to be able to do this, to cook all this food, to prepare it, and, uh, as many women are, may Allah bless you all, my dear sisters who are watching this program, I've seen this many times, the guy comes home, he's like, I've got a guest, I'm sorry, I didn't have any advance notice, and so she has to cook, cook up something, she has to prepare something, or heat up something, and then make sure that it looks all beautiful and presentable, may Allah bless you for that, right? And so, from, from one verse, brothers and sisters, we deduce generosity. We deduce caring for your uh, guest. We deduce um, uh, the wife and the husband working together and making sure that the guests are honored. We deduce so many things from one tiny verse. And I'll talk about the rest of it, inshallah, after we, ta after we take this phone call, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, Alana, I wanted to say that what you were saying about food translation, um, that makes sense because if families look after and work together to help provide for cook and clean, I'm, then nothing I'm, to be done basically. And I was also going to say, see society, that's where people go wrong, and I'm talking about general society. If your kids are not brought up right there, that is, for example, the big story about in the news, when people go and wait on children, not children, there was a racist that was going out and he was chasing and he was waiting for the moment and now he's been caught because the car crashed, it was on the news. But I was going to say that person was brought up disgusting, that's how somehow he went wrong, he had to do wrong things, that's why bad things happen. Because he wasn't following the good things what God teaches us, to have respect and honour, he wasn't doing that. That's how we get criminals and murderers. Because society somehow, they went away from all the manners and goodness. They started to do what's wrong, and then, then we get corrupted and evil society. That's what I want okay. to mention. So I'm like, a Ramadan Kareem. Thank you so much, sister. Ramadan Kareem to you and uh, to our, uh, all our dear viewers. I, the quality, the voice quality on that phone call wasn't uh, very good, but... Um, I think I think what the sister was talking about was society's standards and the, sort of what we were talking about earlier on how society seems to impose a certain set of um, etiquette and standards on on individuals and so um, as a result of that what happens is that suddenly cooking at home becomes this abhorrent grotesque menial task uh, for for women and um, conversely, when it comes to the man, uh, again, they, they feel like they're, um, they're, they're, there are certain things that they're just not allowed to do or, or it's you know, too menial for them or too degrading for them to do. And of course, what, what I've been saying is we take our standards, brothers and sisters, from the Qur'an and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. We take our lifestyle choices. We take how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in society again, from the pristine, beautiful values as set out by the Holy Qur'an and the lives of the Holy Prophet and his immaculate household. What society says is irrelevant to us. What matters is that we live a true, authentic Islamic life, a life that is derived from the teachings of the Holy Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. And at the end of the day, um, I was speaking to a sister just the other day uh, who was saying that, you know, my husband, he, he's hindered my progress and he hasn't allowed me to reach my fruition and I could have been something much bigger. And mind you, this, this sister uh, is someone that, you know, I respect her and I respect her family. But my response to that was, unfortunately, sometimes we fall into the trap of having society dictate to us what our true potential is, right? And so in modern society, true potential uh, often refers to someone making a successful career or, or earning a lot of money or having a lot of money saved up for retirement. And my response is, look, you know, the greatest achievement, and I said this to, to the sister in question, your greatest achievement was giving birth to these beautiful children, raising them in a manner that is pleasing to God and the Prophet and the Imams. Don't let society take that away from you. Don't let society tell you that that is an, is an underachievement, that that's not your true potential, that your true potential is to somehow be working elsewhere, serving random strangers and exchanging 
exchange for money. Your true potential is to be a woman who fulfills her capacity as a woman, right? As a woman, you're able to achieve great things. And one of the greatest things you can do, it's like when they talk about artists, right? They say, for example, um, uh, Picasso uh, drew this painting or Da Vinci drew that, that artwork. And that artwork is really the thing that speaks to your potential and to your artistic value and to your abilities and, and so on and so forth. Your canvas, your artwork, your sculpture are your children, right? Is what I said to that sister. The reason I mentioned this just as an example was to illustrate how we should not submit to the standards set by society. We have our own standards and it's those standards that we strive to fulfill. So let me continue with that verse which I was speaking about where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us no less than six, seven different teachings from one tiny incident. Ibrahim sneaking out from where his guests were to speak to his wife and to bring, to bring back the kebabs. By the way, those of you who are fasting today uh, in preparation for the holy month of Ramadan or because today is your first day of the month of Ramadan, I'm sure you're drooling at the idea of being served kebabs by Prophet Ibrahim and his wife. I'm sorry to do that to you, um, to torture you that way, but inshallah fat, um, uh, iftar is very soon. Now, um, let me finish that story and just help create some more context, inshallah. When Ibrahim came back and offered the food to his guest, the Quran says, um, He brought the, he presented them with the food, but they refused to eat. Allah says in the Quran that Ibrahim became frightened of them, of these guests. Now, why would someone be frightened when his guests refuse to eat? The answer lies in the, the prevalent culture at the time. So at the time, um, and in fact, even in some tribal cultures in Iraq and elsewhere nowadays, if you offer food to a guest and they refuse to eat it, it means that they wish to bring, bring harm to you. Why? Because in Arab culture, uh, if, uh, if someone eats from your food, they become bound uh, in sort of like a, a social code with you. They're bound by a code. And the code is, you've eaten from this person, you cannot harm them in any way. But if you refuse to eat, it means that you don't want to be bound to that code of ethics, and therefore you might have an ill intention towards them. فَأَوْجَسَ مِنْهُمْ خِيفَةً قَالُوا لَا تَخَفْ They said to him, do not be afraid. The reason we are not eating is because we are angelic beings. We are celestial angels who have been sent down by God to deliver the good news to you. وَبَشَّرُوهُ بِغُلَامٍ عَلِيمٍ And they gave him glad tidings of being given a young boy who will be knowledgeable, who will have knowledge, meaning Prophet Ishaq uh, فَأَقْبَلَتِ امْرَأَتُهُ His wife then came to him saying, how could I be... How could I get pregnant when I'm barren? How could you get pregnant? How can you father a child when you are in fact an old man, right? So we have, we have two really good reasons not to get pregnant, not to have children. How can this happen? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, فَأَقْبَلَتِ امْرَأَتُهُ فِي صَرَّةٍ فَسَكَّتْ وَجْهَهَا وَقَالَتْ عَجُوزٌ عَقِيمٌ I'm both old and barren. قَالُوا كَذَلِكَ قَالَ رَبُّكِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْحَكِيمُ الْعَلِيمُ That is what your Lord has said. He is wise and He is all knowing. And again, another lesson to be derived from this is that anything's possible. Brothers and sisters, the holy month of Ramadan is a month of devotion, prayer and supplication. So don't ever say to yourself, I'm not going to pray for that because we know, we both know it's not going to happen. Whether it's an illness, whether it's a financial uh, predicament, whether it's a problem that you feel powerless uh, in alleviating, whatever the issue is, Allah is all powerful. Allah is all wise. Allah is all knowing. Allah is the one who created us from nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can and often does change fate. That's why we believe in Laylatul Qadr. 
That's why the night of destiny is so special. Because on that night, God decrees our providence. God chooses our destiny. God decides what's going to happen to us from now until the next year. So my point is, brothers and sisters, inshallah, in this holy month, let us maximize our uh, benefits and our rewards by reciting the Qur'an, by contemplating on the Qur'an, by applying the Qur'an, by learning about the Qur'an from the Ahlul Bayt, from the Holy Household, the Prophet of the family, uh, the, the, the family of the Prophet. May God's peace and blessings be upon them all, inshallah. We'll take a quick break perhaps and come back. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's uh, great to have you back in this live uh, broadcast on Ahlul Bayt TV. Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. All praise be to Allah for having allowed us to live yet another year and to experience yet another uh, blessed month of Ramadan. There are those who are now lo no longer with us. There are loved ones, I'm sure you can relate, or friends or people that you know uh, who used to be with us um, uh, the year before or perhaps before that and are no longer uh, here to experience the incredible rewards and infinite blessings of the holy month of Ramadan. And so the fact that you and I have been giving this, given this privilege um, means that we should be ever thankful, but also try and maximize our benefit from it, inshallah, by planning, as I said earlier, uh, by scheduling properly, uh, for our Ramadan-related activities and by ensuring that when we um, uh, uh, plan for those activities, we prioritize and that we prioritize the Holy Qur'an as well as uh, learning about the Holy Qur'an. I said earlier, brothers and sisters, that uh, unfortunately we don't take the Qur'an seriously. We need to take it seriously. Allah says in the Holy Qur'an, Ya Yahya khudil kitaba bi quwwah. Take this book in firmness, with firmness, right? We need to take it with firmness, inshallah, by learning about it, by reciting it, and benefiting from it, inshallah. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Do we have a caller on the line? Assalamu alaikum. Do we have a caller on the line? Assalamu alaikum. Are you there? Wa alaikum assalam. Yes, Sayyid, I'm here. My name is Sayyid Hussain. I'm calling from London. It's uh, great to have you, brother. I had the pleasure of listening to you during a young bus here in London a couple of months ago. Pleasure's all mine, um, brother. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, which is one of the uh, things that the and the Sunnah have been raising recently about the uh, concept of the imama within, the, uh, within our faith. And that is that. Um, they're saying that if there was no opposition to the Imams from day one, and Amir al Mumin became the Imam, and we went through the 12 Imams without any opposition at all, uh, to the extent that the 12th Imam, uh, Al Hujjah, he came and he conducted his Imam. And they're saying that if, assuming that each Imam lived for 78, 90 years, the total duration of 12 months would not be more than a couple of hundred years, maybe 300 years. And therefore, they're arguing that their concept of Shura, and I know there are flaws in that argument as well, I mean, indeed, there is no good for right now, but they're arguing that if this is the case with the 12 months and there was no opposition, what would have happened after the 12 months? Mm -hmm. I have some ideas which I thought logically myself, but I wanted to see what your uh, thoughts were on this topic. Sure, sure. Thought. Thank you so much for that, brother. Jazakumullah khair. Um, so I will address that question um, uh, once I finish the thought that I was going to share with you. Again, maximizing our benefits from the Holy Qur'an means that you take those verses and you read them diligently and 
trying to extrapolate teachings from those verses and applying them to your life. Uh, I'll share maybe a, a one, one or two more examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He's speaking about how to uh, treat one's parents, right? God has decreed that you shall not worship anyone other than Him. And to show uh, kindness uh, to the parents. Then Allah says, notice this very subtle um, nuance if you like, but it's incredibly important and something that I think is relevant to many people's lives today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, uh, So when they grow old with you, then you should do such and such. Now, what's important about this is this kaf عندك, when they grow old with you, Meaning, and this is a question that we get all the time, what do we do with our parents when they grow too old? Do we send them to nursing homes? Do we keep them with us? It's difficult to have them with us. Obviously, especially in this part of the world, in the United Kingdom, in London, where homes are very small and so forth, what's the best thing, what's the best approach? My answer is, you keep your parents with you for as long as you can. That is what the Quran wants us to do. I know it's hard. I know that sometimes, um, it's for their own good that they get sent to a nursing home, right? Uh, especially if they are suffering from an illness, a sickness, where the nursing home is really just a de facto hospital to them. It's not just a place for them to rest. And so my point is this, brothers and sisters, you can take and learn, and, and in those cases, by the way, um, then perhaps it is in their, in their best interest to be sent to a home. But in most cases, it's inconvenient to have your parents around, so be it. It's inconvenient to have both the kids running around and the parents there needing things and so forth. So be it. They are your parents. You respect them. You cherish them and you take care of them until the last waking moment of your life. Inshallah, if you get the chance to do that, you can learn all of that and apply it from the Holy Quran. Let's take one more caller, inshallah, and then try and answer the questions. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mohammed Mehdi Rubai and I'm from London. I have two Thank questions. You. Sure. Um, one is, is it better to read, uh, if for a long Arabic speaker, is it better to read the translation in English of the Quran or in Arabic? So I'll answer that question. Thank you so much for the, for the call and the question before uh, wrapping up with the other question we had previously. Is it better to recite in Arabic? Absolutely. I am of the opinion, and, and uh, a lot of scholars out there as well, that the translation can never be perfected. You can never really translate a verse of the Quran into any other language simply because of the denseness, the depth of the Arabic language. One word, like I, the verse that I recited earlier about Prophet Ibrahim, faragha, this ragha uh, means so much and you can extrapolate so much from it. Um, that I feel the Arabic language is, is far superior to any other language. And so it's better to read it in Arabic. But at the same time, many Farsi speakers do this, some Urdu speakers do this. They read the Arabic and they have the translation right underneath. So if there is a, a word or, or something that you didn't quite understand, you could quickly refer to the translation. So yes, I would highly recommend that. As for the other question we had about the Imams and what would have happened if the, if the Imams were able to, to live out their... Um, their uh, 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 vicegerency and their uh, authority and their leadership without any obstruction, without any hindrance, what would have happened? Well, I, I don't think it's um, useful to engage in hypotheticals. Uh, what would have happened is a question that we'll never know, I guess, um, unless and until the 12th Imam reappears and changes the world uh, into into a utopian paradise, right? What would have happened is that there would be, there would have been no bloodshed, there would have been no carnage, there would have been no injustice. We got a glimpse into the world of Imam Al Mahdi with the four years when Imam Ali became the Khalifa, a mere glimpse of the sense of justice and equity that was provided to the world by God Himself through Amirul Mu'mineen. Uh, despite the fact that his four years were marred with, with wars and conflicts that were imposed against him uh, in those short four years. However, one thing I will tell you is that we have, I believe, what is a tradition which says that if the Imams were, not, were never killed, 
they would not have died. Meaning that they would have lived just like Imam al-Mahdi would, has lived until now and until the day God chooses for him to rise up. If the Prophet and the, uh, the subsequent Imams of the Ahlul Bayt had not been murdered and assassinated and systematically um, uh, killed one after the other, they would have in fact lived uh, their lives uh, for a very long time and, and really um, had God's mercy and and justice and compassion delivered to humanity. Thank you very much. Do join me tomorrow again, inshallah, at the same time where we will continue these discussions and try and uh, take this journey of uh, spirituality and learning in the holy month of Ramadan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.